Hey, Paul, how are you going? Yeah, yeah, good, mate. Good, mate. How are you? Yep, yeah, we're flying. Um, so, you know, we've been asked to do a video on EVs. I've owned my sort of Tesla now for about six to seven months. So, a few learnings, a few things I've learned um, having that car now for that period of time. I know you've been interested in EVs in the past. So, yeah, yeah, yeah that's right. We'll do a bit of a drive along. We can ask a few questions along the way, see what we can learn, so we can um, see some of the things we know about EVs and hopefully give a good insight. And that sounds so, good to me. I'll be ready to pick you up in about five, 10 minutes. No, no, perfect. I'll be ready. All right. All right. I'll see you then. All right. See you, mate. See you soon. Bye. Ready to roll? Yeah. All right. What's that? Yeah. So what's the FBT exemption? So the FBT exemption uh, allows uh, people to evade at least an EV with an FBT exemption, which essentially makes it much, much cheaper for those who can. Um, it makes it very affordable. Um, and aside from that, there's also the environmental benefits and then there's also the, the, the tech side of it. So a lot of EVs have some of the latest technology um, and it makes them quite sort of exciting from that regard world sort of comparison that we did like with the how comparing with yeah, the FBT okay, yeah. tax like a 70 is the equivalent a $70,000 EV is the equivalent of a $40,000 petrol yeah, car yeah pretty much so once you factor in that FBT exemption you are correct that a $45,000 petrol car will cost about the same as a, a $70,000 EV or thereabouts but yeah it obviously depends on how many k's you do and how much fuel you use yeah. I think one thing people don't really get is how much difference that, that fuel saving is. So, so currently I've done about 12,000 Ks on this car and I've spent about $120 so far on, on charging. So if you can charge at home, it is quite cheap. The other thing is with, with charging, um, there's different ways of charging. Obviously you can charge at home, you can charge at fast chargers. Fast chargers are a lot more expensive. So you're, you're looking at 40 cents up to sort of 80 cents for some of the high speed Tesla chargers um, per kilowatt hour. So this car has a 60 kilowatt hour battery. Some have larger, so you can multiply that cost per per hour based off the battery size and you can sort of calculate then how much you're gonna cost you to fill up. Whereas charging at home is generally sort of 30 cents um, on a sort of 25 to 30 cents on a standard um, power deal. So you're talking 25 cents times 60 to fill up this car, um, yeah, so you can watch that for $25. Um, but there is a lot of EV plans now on different companies who allow you to sort of charge overnight for eight cents. So I'm on one of those deals, so it's uh, eight cents between midnight and 6 a.m. and then free between 11 and 2. So that's kind of how I've been able to keep it so cheap, it's doing about a third of my charging during the day. And between that 11 and 2 time where it's free with a surplus supply of solar. So this car, you can just set a uh, control it all within the app. Um, this being a Tesla, I'm not sure, I'm not sure what other cars would have the similar thing where you just set the charge time. So I'm not sitting there going at midnight running and plugging it in. It's, <laughs> it's yeah. plugging in at 9 p.m. Or, or what have you before bed and then thing. So. Um, and then would, it, I've scheduled mine to charge, start charging at 12.15 and it'll just have charge from there. So I think that's probably the biggest change that people sort of need to wrap their heads around is treating it. Because I know people worry about range or how far can I get and things like that. And it, these are a bit more like a phone where you just sort of plug it in at night and set and forget. So it's a bit less, um, a bit less work from that regard, you don't have to go to a petrol station, it's, you sort of have to change your thinking a little bit. Yeah, so, yeah I'm also, I guess whilst we're on the charging, can you just explain a bit more on the different types of charges that are available to people? Yeah, so there's a few different types of charges, obviously there's at home, um, that usually ranges between 7.4 kilowatt hours and, well, depending on the car, up to 22. Um, but for that you need three phase power connected, so that's AC charging, and then you've got DC charging, which is a lot faster. 
Um, and usually, the more the higher speed, the more cost. So to get um, that those cheaper rates, you're, you're charging at home and you're usually charging overnight. Um, to get uh, fast charging, you have 15, 20 minute supercharge. I think I'm not sure some of the Tesla ones got the 150, 200 kilowatts. Um, so you're charging it, that's sort of a 15, 20, 30 minute type thing to, to go from like 20% to 80%. So it's a very much more rapid um, charge. Um, for some cars, they're not, it's not recommended to charge above 80%. Some it's recommended more to keep it uh, under 80%. That's for uh, nickel, the nickel batteries. And you've got the this, this one, which is lithium ion phosphate, and it's recommended to go up to 100 Like once a supercharger, and then maybe also like, because it's like a mobile phone, like you don't always need to have it at a hundred percent. Like it's if you're just driving around locally, picking up kids from school, like you might, yeah, yeah. And that's the thing; people sort of focus. You're on not what? charging it from zero. You might be charging it from seventy to eighty. Yeah. So it doesn't need to be on charge all night. Or yeah, and that's the thing too. Like most most people, I think they're sort of you know, they'll focus a lot on range, but the amount of times people are doing more than 400 k's in a single drive is probably fairly low. So, you know, for the average person, uh, you know, they're doing 20 k's to work, 20 k's back, the, the range is fine, you, you don't, don't usually have any issues. If people are doing super long range, then yeah, then, then they might need to sort of make sure that the relevant charging infrastructure is in place uh, for the journeys that they want to do. It's pretty good up the east coast, but if you're traveling inland Australia, you know, it take a bit more preparation and planning, I think those type of journeys. So to fully charge this car overnight would be about $4. Um, if you're doing a third of your charging for free, you're paying about $3 on average to fill up the car and you're doing 400 Ks. So you know, an equivalent petrol car to do 400 Ks, which is usually what, say $100 plus to, you know, $120 to fill a tank and you're probably going to do 400 Ks, you're probably going to use Two thirds of that tank, so yeah, about eighty dollars versus four, um, and then even cheaper if you're using the free charging. So um, you can start recouping those costs very quickly, and then factor in the maintenance costs on top of that. Uh, the maintenance costs are very low, so maintenance costs, petrol costs is where a lot of the savings are. Then you add the FBT exemption as well, so that, I think that's why we had a sort of big uptick in EV sales right when that Novate at least deal came in. But yeah, once you, um, you've also got a few extra costs like insurance can be more expensive. Um, you, you can go through tires a bit more quicker because the cars are a bit heavier. But yeah, I think people need to, you need to look at the equation of if you're saving two thousand dollars a year on petrol um, and say less five hundred dollars a year on maintenance. Yeah, you can quickly sort of go well an equivalent uh, combustion engine car. Even if it's ten thousand dollars cheaper over four years, you're, you're about to break even. So if you keep the car over four years, you know the, the EV starts to look more and more compelling. So one thing with EVs on the efficiency front is they're more efficient um, driving around city and urban environments than they are on a freeway where air resistance has some effects. So EV is really good at recouping the energy loss um, when you brake or you don't need to brake. So. As soon as I take my foot off the accelerator, the car will automatically slow itself down and use that to recharge the battery. And from that, um, yeah, you get really good efficiency driving around the city, um, as opposed to sort of combustion engines, which tend to do better on the freeway. So that's probably something people wouldn't be too aware of, is yeah, you, you're gonna get better efficiency driving around local streets than you are um, on a freeway. So you'll see here, So you see here when I take my foot off the accelerator, it will go green. It's showing the battery charging. If I accelerate, it will go like that. As I take my foot off the accelerator, then you'll see the battery charge up and it will regen that energy back into the battery. Motor driven. Yeah, because I guess the big one though was initially the, the biggest deterrent was the cost of a EV. They were all, you know, seventy-five, eighty thousand dollars and now they've come down, down significantly. significantly. Yeah. So, you know, um, and you've got new players coming to the market as well. So BYD 
they just come out with um, the Dolphin. I think it's the Dolphin, and that's a lot cheaper. Um, you, Tesla's brought their air prices down significantly. I think, you know, a Model Y when they first came out were in the 75,000. Now you can get a Model Y under 60,000. Yeah. So when you compare that, um, and that's also at the same time where a lot of combustion engine cars have gone up. So, yeah, I, I would say that you know, comparing the cost, once you factor in the running cost, the 60,000 EV is probably going to cost you about 50, the equivalent of a $50,000, $45,000 petrol car. So I guess, yeah, I guess we've touched on the cost savings, better for the environment. What a what are three things you love about an EV? Uh, one thing is they're often, often packed with a lot of um, tech and features. Um, I'm not sure if that's you know, is there anything limiting there to an EV, but they, they tend to have really good tech. The kids love playing with the stereo and the watching movies and stuff like that when the car's parked. Um, and yeah, so, you know, they're, they're more, you get software updates. Um, the self-driving features within a Tesla are really, you know, I think sort of <laughs> surprise people when they first get used to it. But also, like, the, just the way it drives, it drives very smoothly. It's very, um, you got instant acceleration. It's very smooth. It's very fluid. It's very quiet. Um, you know, it's, um, one thing I love about this car is you can connect it to your phone, so you can heat it up even on a cold day you can warm the car up with your phone or it starts slowing your patterns and will warm itself up before you even drive the set off so by the time you go get in the car the seat warm is already warmed up the car's already warmed up and your stereo is playing everything you're ready for you um, and then not having to go to petrol stations that's always a win so saves me money on petrol and saves me money on buying snacks as well <laughs> <laughs> so with the so often you see in the media some, you know, bad press about, you know, mass recalls, but sometimes those recalls may sound worse than they actually are because being technology driven, a lot of them can be done over the air. Yeah, and that's another big difference with the Tesla is <clears throat> over the air software updates. So um, there's been a case where, you know, I think it was in the US, they had a recall on a Tesla and then when you actually broke it down it was they needed to change the icon size in the screen so it was literally just a software update and, and that, pro that problem solved but it does get a lot of media so obviously there's a lot of attention around EVs in particular Tesla and Elon Musk it generates a lot of um, clicks on, on websites and stuff like that so um, there's going to be a lot of articles both positive and negative anything around self-driving also gets a lot of attention so um, there is a lot of attention I think on, on EVs I think some of it is warranted a lot of it isn't I think. like would you if I'm a young family two car family would like maybe two EVs might not be the best play but one EV one petrol or one EV one hybrid uh, I'd say it depends on depending on your circumstance like how, how many long drives do you do even then, like, I've got sort of young kids and we're not driving 400 k's yeah. without stopping, so that, that range thing is not a problem for us. But for other people, if, you, if you're doing lots of long drives frequently, yeah, yeah, um, that may be a factor for you, but for the majority of I'm doing, uh, for the majority of driving we do, uh, an EV is more than adequate. And in fact, the biggest problem we have now is the kids don't want to go in the other car. <laughs> yeah. So they, we can't. My son will. <laughs> doesn't want to go to school and anything other than the Tesla. So, no like school. storage space. Storage space. So, a lot of EVs have a lot of really good storage space. One because there's no engine. So, uh, when we go away, we can fit. Uh, you can fit a suitcase in the front because there's no engine there. Uh, they also don't have a spare, so you can fit a suitcase underneath the boot. So this car has a heap of storage space, and a lot of EVs do. Um, and a lot of get a bit more passenger comfort because you don't have a transmission hump in the back so you get a sort of flat floor some EVs um, passengers in the back though their legs can sit quite high so that can be annoying for some this is a rear wheel drive version this is the, the cheap 
cheapest and, and slowest, but it's by no means slow compared to sort of a traditional family car. But when you, yeah, if you're, um, if you start going higher in the model range, you can get like some of these are uh, really, really, really quick. The performance models you're talking, you know, Ferrari type takeoff. Um, maybe not the same speed around the track, but very, very fast off the line. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, they, they start to do, you go from, this is just a rear wheel motor. Um, the other ones have more motors in the front as well. But, yes, like a sitting in this, there's, yeah, you do not need the performance model. This is yeah, more plenty. Than enough, more than enough for most people. It's probably if you want the extra range. Yeah. Um, is it, I think that's probably another thing that's really different once you go with an EV, is going back to a combustion engine. I found that transition harder than going from the, um, when I drive this car, for an example, it's forgetting to turn the um, other car off. Uh, <laughs> you're getting keys. Because this car just uses your phone as a key. Um, you're used to all that type of stuff. And, um, yeah, yeah. You end up leaving doors unlocked, engines running. See, people always think that technology is for younger people. But it's definitely it's easy to get used to and everything's like intuitive yeah things do what you expect them to do like I would like I'm just I'm trying to think would my mum and dad buy an EV next yeah I, I think it's you know they've obviously thought about things quite carefully and in some cases it's, it's easier to drive particularly you know if, if I was an older person the self-driving features would probably be, you know give me a bit more confidence to to drive knowing those assist, you know, drive assist features are there, but yeah, yeah, I, I think once someone gets up to speed with this, anyone could drive it. It's not like it's sort of like if you have a smartphone, you're more than qualified yeah. to drive an EV. Yeah, yeah it's kind of very, very similar um, type thing to a smartphone. Yeah, the charging, the, the software updates over here. So, like a traditional car, you. You know, you take it to the dealer, you get it serviced, you get the oil changed, and then maybe, like with the EV, it's more like, yeah, you download an update and hit install. Yeah, maybe, so, if that's how it works. So, yeah, one big difference with EVs is the way that they're serviced. Their electric motors don't require the same level of servicing as a mechanical engine. So the traditional combustion engine car has a lot more moving parts. You've got, you know, a lot of... Tr got a, a lot of transfer of energy from different parts in the car and that creates a lot of friction and a lot of wear and tear um, and, and this is a, this, you know, means that you, you need a lot of servicing whereas yeah um, these cars some, some people <laughs> don't get them serviced very regularly at all and others will um, yeah get certain parts service as required but mechanically there's not a lot to to service in these cars they're a lot simpler mechanically, but they are, um, yeah, not saying things can't go wrong, but they are a lot simpler mechanically, so you, you generally have a lot lower maintenance cost. Um, and at the moment, yeah, you, to, to, to book in a service call, you literally just get the, use the app, everything's done in the app, so, um, yeah, I recently got a puncture tire, uh, just message test us with the app, and they come up spare tire right on the spot so it's very very different so that is a different model to traditional cars because yeah the, these EVs don't have a spare wheel yes so um, whether it's due to space or range or, or weight um, a lot of EVs don't have spare wheels and so the, yeah, there's some risk around that in not having a spare uh, tire most come with 24 24 hour road assist 24-7 yep. road assist, but that's another sort of factor to be aware of is yeah, if, you're, if you're doing sort of really remote driving that you want to be um, careful in that regard. I don't know if that's the case for all EVs, but certainly in Tesla, yeah. you don't have a spare wheel. And that's speaking from experience. <laughs> Having said that, I had my old car 15 years and <laughs> never needed the spare wheel, and then I've had this car for six months and it needed one, so I can track going that left lane. One, so we've talked about how EVs are cheaper in a lot of 
aspects. However, one thing that commonly comes up is insurance. Yeah. Um, insurance is more expensive. I think that's one part due to the car being sometimes more expensive. In other cases, it's, um, yeah, the cost of repairs are, can be more complex. So I think there's a lot of electronics. You think about this car, it's got cameras everywhere for the self-driving systems. But yeah. Um, I think that could be a bit more complicated to fix. So hence the, the high insurance cost, but that's probably another thing people should be aware of is um, potentially a higher premium 